Well, last week, we started looking at this idea of God testing us, didn't we? And the question for us was, if no one likes trouble, if no one likes hardships, no one likes difficult, ugly things in their lives, how does a loving God allow those things, sometimes actually put those things in our lives. And we saw that God actually has a purpose in allowing those things to be in our lives. God doesn't waste our pain. He doesn't waste our hardships, as uh, Pastor Rick Warren would say. And I, I must tell you again, I am deeply indebted to him for many of the ideas that established the, the foundation of this sermon today. But rather, God uses our pain. He uses our troubles and hardships. He uses them to test us. The purpose of these tests from God is to grow our faith, to make us like Jesus. Remember, that's God's number one goal in our life, not to make you happy, not to make you content, but to make you like Jesus. So that the purpose of these tests is to push us to grow into Christ likeness. And if you were able to be here last week, then you know I also told you not only does God test us, but he wants us to pass the tests, doesn't he? He's not like some some mean teacher passing out a test from heaven, sitting back and viciously waiting for us all to fail. Ha ha ha, because that gives him joy. No, he wants us to pass the test, because when we pass, that means, well, that, that we have stretched our faith to become more like Jesus. And that's what God wants. That's what he's after. So he gives us the answers to these life tests ahead of time. And he gives us the answers in the Bible. All the tests you will face in your life, are all, uh, the answers are already found in the Bible. You just got to know where to look for them. Whether we realize it or not, we're all already undergoing these tests from God. Because he wants to grow us to be like Jesus. And so he's not going to wait. So he's already testing us over and over again. The question is, are you ready for these tests? And if you're ready, do you recognize these tests when they come along? Do you recognize them for what they are and what they're for? And since God has already given you the answers ahead of time, do you know them? Or do you at least know where to go find them? Are you prepared for the test? And so in order to answer all those questions with a resounding yes, we're going to spend some time this summer in the coming weeks looking at these different tests, some of the tests God is going to give us. We're going to look at some of the people God tested in the scriptures, some of the people who passed the test, and we're going to see what answers they found, what's the answer there, and how can we know it, how can we use that in our life so that when we face similar tests, we are ready to pass. So we look at these tests, and we get to the first test today, which is seen in the account of Noah and the ark. Now, i got to tell you, as a preacher, approaching a sermon about Noah's ark is a, bit, a little bit of a simpler approach than, than uh, when, when I usually preach, because when you preach about other topics... Some people might know about it a little bit, might know some of the biblical background. Some people might not know anything, and so you're just like, you have to account for that. But when we talk about Noah's Ark, pretty much everyone you meet knows something about Noah's Ark. Who knows the basics of the story of Noah and the Ark? Raise your hand. Y'all got to raise your hand, right? Yeah, that's why Reese's Peanut Butter uh, can have a commercial for Reese's Peanut Butter Cups about Noah's Ark, because everyone knows it, right? Uh, it's, just, it's so cute. We tell everyone this idea of, the, of this man... Uh, taking all these cute animals that come to him and he puts them on a big boat, we call it an ark, so that they can be saved from a flood. Oh, it's so cute. It's so cute. So we just share it with our, our kids from the earliest moments on, right? We're all about Noah and the ark in the church with our kids. You know, some of you had kids and when they were little in their nurseries, or maybe you remember when you were a kid, or maybe you got grandkids, and probably everyone here could say, uh, yeah, there was at least something in the nursery or in their room that had something to do with Noah's Ark, right? Because we're all about, oh, it's so cute. When, when my little niece, Jaina, was getting ready to turn two, her parents ordered her a special Noah in the Ark book, and they, they had to send in a picture of Jaina, and then the company superimposed Jaina in all these scenes with Noah on the Ark. So in this first page, there's Jaina uh, welcoming the 
animals onto the ark with Noah. And the next page, she's, she's with Noah helping to feed the animals. And, and the next page, she's with Noah trying to calm them down. And then the next page, she's just out on the deck of the ark having a good time with the animals because it must have been so pleasant, right? You know, but it, it's so cute. You've got to put your kids in that story. You know, we even do it here. Look, I remembered. I, I went and got this. This hangs on our wall in the church nursery. Did you know this? When was the last time any of you were in the church nursery? Yeah, uh, it's Noah's Ark. And there's a cute little animal for every letter of the alphabet, right? And here's Noah and Mrs. Noah. We don't know her name, so she's just Mrs. Noah. And they're, and they're, they're just looking at this. Isn't it lovely? And it's so cute. And we talk about it all the time. I remember one of the first stories from the Bible I remember learning about in Sunday school was Noah and the Ark. We're just so completely taken by this idea of this man saving all these cute furry animals that we tell our children the story all the time. But on the other side of it, we are so taken by the idea of these cute furry animals that we overlook the truth that the account of Noah and the Ark it's really very dark. It's kind of like the darkest story we could ever tell our kids because the animals have to be saved on that ark. Why? Because God is destroying everything and everyone else on the earth. I mean, that's the point. That's the purpose of the flood. These animals are being saved from. God's just destroying and killing everyone. It's really dark. How do we get there? Because what, what the Bible starts out, we see God created the earth and, and, and it was perfect, right? There are no problems, no sorrow, no sins, no diseases, no tears, no trials, no sufferings. It was paradise. And then, well, what happened? Humans showed up. People showed up. They rebel against God. They sin. And once they started, we, we just kept going. We just kept sinning and, and, and making it worse and worse and worse, right? So the longer humans were on this earth, uh, the more we brought into it more conflict, more wars, more injustice, more racism, more abuse of all kinds. See, God didn't start those things. God didn't create those things. Humans are the ones who brought those into the earth. Murder, jealousy, cheating, dishonesty, adultery. The world just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And, and, and because uh, of this destruction brought to his creation by humankind, God became grieved. So grieved that he said, I am going to destroy it all and start all over. I'm just going to start all over. I'm going to wipe it all out. So God looked at what had become of his creation. And he was looking for one righteous person that he could save to, to start all over with later. And, and earth was so evil that God can only find one man. Noah. Noah. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. So amidst all these other vile representations of humankind on earth, every other person in the world was just vile, Noah finds God's grace. Noah receives God's favor. He's the only one. So I want you to think about that for a moment. Without Noah, none of us would be here. Because there would be no one to start over with again. So aren't we lucky? And, and we all come from Noah. Right? So we all come from the same race. So forget about this. Oh, we're going to separate. We're going to judge people according to their, their skin color or these other racial walls. We as humans build up. No, we're all one race. The human race. And that's, that's where Noah comes from. That's his backstory. And with that backstory in place, let me read to you uh, what the scriptures say, starting at Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. It says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. 
but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. So, we read this in Genesis, and, and, and I want you just for, for, for a moment um, with me, imagine with me, you're Noah. You're like the, the guy that God comes and he's talking to. And God comes and says, well, 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 well you know, uh, th this earth, uh, well, well, it's an evil place. And you don't even think about arguing with God in, in this case because, well, you live through it every day. You're a righteous person, and it's all around you. You encounter it every day. It's evil. But then God kind of shocks you. He says, because of that, I'm going to destroy it all and start all over. Now, that's kind of shocking. And God says, I'm going to flood the earth, and all the people are going to be destroyed. So he says to you, you know, build a boat. Build a big boat. In fact, this boat's going to be one and a half times the size of a football field. Jim, show us, will you please? Here's, here's a graphic that kind of illustrates how big the ark was. The ark is that thing that looks like a wood block there, because we, we have our fancy pictures of Noah's ark. But this is guy Noah and his son's building us. That's what it would have looked like, right? Yeah, and it's 450 feet long. God said, Noah, build it. Just you and your sons. No shipyards, no foundries. Just you and your sons build this. Because God says to you, I'm going to send a whole bunch of animals for you to put on this ark to save them when I flood the whole world. Only those in the ark, that's you, Noah, and your family, and these animals, only those in the ark are going to be saved. I'm going to use you to repopulate the earth afterwards. So God comes to you and says this. Now, now here's the question. Do you believe him? I mean, would you believe God was telling you this? Or would you just kind of give him one of these looks? Right? You know the look. Anyone with kids knows this look. And you're like, what? What are you telling me? Really? And that's the first test. The first test is God gives you a new task, maybe a difficult task. He comes to you and he lets you know a little about what, what, what he's going to do. He you know, doesn't give you the whole plan, but he's like, this is, uh, this is what's going to happen. And he makes it clear to you. He tells you what he wants you to do within that. Now, you probably don't hear an audible voice of God telling you these things. Uh, but through, through prayer and through paying attention to the Holy Spirit of God living in you and maybe through the words of other godly people in your life, you, you get an understanding of what God wants you to do. And it's something new. It's maybe something difficult. And maybe it just seems so big. It's impossible. God gives you the impossible dream. This is the what test. That's what we call this test. The what test? Because you just look at God and you say, What? No, really, God, what? And then you try to argue with him and say, no, you got the wrong guy, you got the wrong lady. But it, it always comes back again, and you know, God keeps impressing upon you this idea of what he wants you to do, and you just keep coming back and saying, what? Because it's difficult, or it's new, or it's something you can't imagine. You just can't get your head around how you're going to do this. Imagine that's what Noah was like when, when God came to him and said these things. Noah was telling, uh, God was telling Noah to do, do the impossible. Uh, it must have seemed impossible. Just building that boat alone would have seemed to be impossible to Noah. But beyond that, there are other impossible things because, uh, you know, many, some biblical scholars and historians, they, they look at some of the language used in the first few chapters of the book of Genesis, and, and they conclude that up to this point in time, it hadn't rained on the earth. And they suggest that instead a mist came up from the ground, like a condensation at night maybe, and, and that's what watered the land. So, uh, which means before Noah, there was no rain. There's no rain. There are no floods, ladies and gentlemen. Now, people knew w what uh, rushing water looked like because they had oceans and seas and rivers, and they knew what boats looked like because they, they used them on those things. So when God said, build a boat, Noah knew what God was talking about. But this idea of a flood... What is that even? This is something completely new. So Noah, he, Noah, he must have been thinking, God, you're telling me to build a boat in the middle of dry ground. You're asking me to stretch myself to do something completely new here. That's the what test, right? God, what are you saying? God says, I want you to do this for me. It's something new, something you've never done before. It's going to be difficult, maybe. Maybe you think it's impossible. So your first response is, what? Really? 
when God gives you this test, do you pass this test in your life? I mean, this is the test God's giving Noah. Noah passed it. What's the answer? What answer did Noah give? Well, well, we see Noah's answer described in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Show us, Jim. So, so the account of Noah is way at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, but uh, we kind of get some commentary on it later, almost to the very end of the Bible here in Hebrews. And it says, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. The simple and short answer when God gives Noah the what test, and God calls Noah to something new, something impossible, Noah went and did it. How do you pass this test? You go and do it. Noah built the ark. It says he built it in holy fear. Now we see that the term holy fear. I mean, oh, fear. Oh, no wonder Noah built the ark. He was so afraid of God that if he didn't, he, he was, was going to be disastrous. He was afraid, like, if, if he didn't build this ark, God was going to get this shiny, shiny uh, lightning bolt. He was going to just throw it right down and strike him dead. That's why he did it. No, that's not what the term means. It means Noah felt reverence toward God. It means Noah stood in awe of God. And that's why he built the ark. See, Noah passed the test. When God said, go do this difficult, new, impossible thing for me, Noah went and did it because he was looking at how great and at how awesome his God is. That's where he was looking. He was looking at his all-knowing, all-powerful God. And when you are focusing on God's majesty and his power and his brilliance and his glory, nothing he calls you to is going to seem impossible because it's not impossible. God gives you and I the, the what test. And so often we fail because we're not looking on God with awe. We're not looking on God with reverence, with that holy fear that Noah was. You know, we go to God and we go to him and you know, this is God, you're my provider. God, you're my friend. You're my savior. You're the guy who listens to all my gripes and my concerns and all my wants. But we so often fail to look at him with awe. We don't stand in awe of God. We fail to meditate on His awesomeness. We don't consider as we walk through life every day that the only reason, the only way we actually can do that is because there is an all-powerful, almighty God sustaining it all with His will, with His own power. And we go to God in prayer. And we just like, kind of go to him like, like we're just kind of absentmindedly talking to s some other person we don't even really want to be spending time with. But no, it's God. We, we, we don't look at him in awe. Why do we so often not go to God with holy fear the way Noah did? I think a big part of the problem is we are looking at a whole bunch of other things instead of looking at God with awe, right? We're looking at all the potential problems in a situation. Everything that could go wrong. Everything that could not turn out the way we wanted to or it's not going to turn out the way we expected. And that's what we hone in on. That's where we put our focus. That's where we're looking. And so God comes and he gives us the test. He says, I want to grow your faith. I want to make you more like Jesus. I want to call you to something new, something difficult, something you think is impossible. And we say, nope, not going to do it, God. Think about this. Instead of building the ark, Noah could have said no, right? Noah could have, instead of just uh, looking with awe upon God and doing what he says, Noah could have instead taken his focus and put it on all the other things. He could have been looking at all the what ifs instead. God, what if they laugh at me? That's one of the reasons we watch the commercial, right? Because that guy says, you know, who'd like this peanut butter and chocolate? Noah, and the other guy laughs. He says, you mean the guy building the ark? You know, it's just within our culture. We assume people would have been laughing at Noah for this, right? You know, he, so that's, Noah could have been saying, I'm not doing it, God, because what if they laugh? at me? What if all the animals don't come to me? What if I don't have enough food to feed the animals on the ark? What if I don't get enough pitch and tar on that ark and so the floodwaters come and that boat starts sinking? And, and then, you know, we start looking at all these what ifs and then they start becoming more and more irrational, right? What if the lions eat me alive? Right? Uh, you know, what if the flood never comes? I'll look foolish for even doing something for you in this regard, God. What if... But Noah built the ark because he was standing in awe of God. We are told he built it by faith. Here, faith, 
Faith is facing the future without knowing the what. So the what test is God calling us to something difficult. He's calling us to do it in faith even when we don't know what is going to be the result. Noah lived out that faith. He grew in his faith because he was looking the whole time at the glory of God. He stood in awe of God. That's how he was able to pass the test. See, you're going to have this same test from God over and over again in your life. He's going to give you the what test. God calls you to do something you've never done before. Maybe something difficult. Maybe it seems impossible. It gives you the impossible dream. And so often when God comes to us with that, we fail the test. We say, no, God, I'm not going to do that because we're looking at the what ifs. What if I fail? What if it doesn't work out the way I imagined? What if it doesn't work out at all? Again, what if people laugh at me? What if you fill in the blank because you know what you're questioning God when he comes to you with these things? We say, no, God, because we're looking at all the what ifs instead of looking at his glory. And then we experience the negative impacts on our lives of that all the time. In our homes, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our churches. Because God is calling us to something new or difficult and we say no instead of looking to him in his glory. And these impacts, they are often far-reaching. I mean, imagine if Noah had told God no. We've already said none of us would be here. None of us. Sometimes when we fail uh, the test and we tell God no, the consequences are felt far and wide. We don't even recognize some of the consequences that we live out then. So let's pass the test. Passing the test means we go after the impossible, the difficult things that God calls us to, the uncomfortable things. We're going to go after them. Noah built an ark by faith without knowing what was going to happen. By that same type of faith, God calls us to great, impossible, sometimes difficult things. We don't need to know the whole plan. We don't need to know the specifics of how things are going to work out, if they're going to work out. All we need is to step back and stand in awe of God. We need to meditate on His awesomeness, to look at God with holy fear. And recognize that with him, with God, nothing is impossible. I'm not sure, but I think Jesus might have said something to that effect one time, right? See, just briefly to close, I ask you the question, is God right now putting you through the what test? Meaning he's given you something new and difficult or maybe even impossible to do for him? He's saying, go do this for me. This is what I want you to be doing. He's giving you the test. Are you passing or are you failing? Are you telling him no? You know, if you're sitting there recognizing, yes, I'm prone to telling God no, I'm prone to failing, then, then I would just advise you, you need to take some time. You actually need to put time in your life specifically to stop and to look at God. To look at him, to stand in awe of God, to really meditate on the greatness of God. Consider how awesome are all his works throughout history, throughout your life. Look to what the scripture says. Consider his majesty and his power and his glory. Take some time to stand in awe of God. Don't just assume it's going to happen, but no, make an effort. See, you do that, that's going to grow your faith. You're going to have the faith of Noah. That faith will grow you to be more like Jesus. And that's what God's after. And that faith will empower you to go and do these new, difficult, impossible things for God. You won't be saying, what God, really? Because everything God tells you to do, everything he calls you to do, it's going to seem so small compared to the greatness of God and his glory. We want to pass the test. You are going to pass the test. You look on God with holy fear. You realize you're going to pass because our God is an awesome God. Let's pray.